We are in week two of a series we kicked off last week called Kenosis, where we're looking at basically the conundrum that exists in our world of the people who identify with the word Christian, identify with the religion of Christianity, often look nothing like the first century rabbi named Jesus that they claim to follow. And so we are looking at an ancient poem in Philippians chapter 2 called the Kenosis poem, which describes what Jesus was like and what it looks like to live a life in the model of Jesus. And today we have the great privilege of having one of the world's leading scholars in Jesus come and talk to us and give us a little bit of insight into who Jesus was historically and what it looks like to follow in Jesus' radical path of self-sacrificial love, his ethical path of giving to the least of these and loving enemies. And so, before I bring our speaker up for our Oprah-style interview, uh, I want to give him a proper introduction, and he has a lot to introduce. So, Dr. John Dominic Crossan is generally regarded to be the premier Jesus scholar in the world today. He received a Doctorate of Divinity from Maynooth College in Ireland, and did postdoctoral research at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. He joined DePaul University Chicago's faculty in 1969 and remained there until 1995, and is now uh, the Professor Emeritus in the Department of Religious Studies. Dr. Crossan is perhaps best known for being the co-chair of the Jesus Seminar from 1985 to 1996, which basically was a group of scholars that got together to look at the Gospels and determine which of the statements in the Gospels were historic to act, the actual man, Jesus? What did Jesus actually say? And what may have been added at a later time? Dr. Crossan has been interviewed on television networks in the United States, such as Nightline, The Early Show, Dateline, Fox News' O'Reilly Factor, interesting one, <laughs> as well as on cable programs. I see Dr. Crossan all the time on the History Channel, because I watch all those Jesus documentaries. And if you watch them around Easter in particular, you'll see his face. Uh, <laughs> he has written 29 books on the historical Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and early Christianity, and his work has been translated into 13 foreign languages. 20 research trips around Eastern Christianity from 2002 to 2015 resulted in his latest book, not primarily of text, but of illustrated images um, and pictures called Resurrecting Easter, How the West Lost and the East Kept the original resurrection vision. We'll talk about that and a lot more this morning, but in mission gathering style, let's give a warm welcome to the Reverend Dr. John Dominic Crossan. Orange. You, you went from orange, orange to, green. to green. Very Irish. Very Irish. <laughs> well, Dr. Crossan, thank you so much for journeying from Florida to San Diego to be with us this right. morning. Right. Yeah. And so Dr. Crossan last night gave a great talk at St. Paul's Cathedral. How many people were there last night? Just to see. So a good number. Yeah. Glad that you were there. <laughs> so just to kind of start off, like I told you, we are in this series called Kenosis, and we're looking at this ancient Christian poem. Uh, that Paul quotes in Philippians chapter 2. And I kind of tried my best to give a little historical analysis of what that was and what the meaning of that um, kenosis passage was in the first century last week. But I figured that the biblical scholar might be able to give a little bit more light on this idea of kenosis and the centrality of that Philippians chapter 2 poem. All right. For, for me, Jesus was a peasant with an attitude. That's it in as short as I can put it after 50 years on it. A peasant with an attitude, but he also claimed that his attitude was the attitude of God. That's the big one. So that means that Jesus had emptied himself of the normal, kenosis meaning empty, the normal violence of civilization. Not just of Roman imperialism, but by living non-violently against the normalcy of violence, he got himself executed. Rome was not savage. It didn't execute people every Friday afternoon just for amusement. But if you oppose Rome, if you oppose Rome violently, it crucified you and your 
lieutenants, your closest followers, in a nice, neat row. It was like state terrorism to let you know your place. If you are a nonviolent opponent of Rome, not a philosopher just talking, but what we would call an activist, but a nonviolent activist against Rome, they picked off the leader. That was their policy. And if you're at it five years from now, we'll come at your next leader. They didn't waste iron nails and a squad of soldiers on nonviolent resistance for all of them. So the most precious thing we know about Jesus, if we knew nothing else, was a good old pilot got it right from the Roman point of view. Jesus was a nonviolent revolutionary, which means that he emptied himself of the normal reaction that any beaten people would have to strike back. And that many of his contemporaries thought was the obvious thing to do. Now, the big challenge, of course, is to claim that that's the way God operates. Wait a minute. The whole Bible is filled with God punishing you for this and that and people crying out for mercy and forgiveness. I'm being told in the book of Deuteronomy that if you're good, God will reward you and if you're bad, God will punish you. So that after a hurricane, you say, what did I do to deserve this? But Jesus teaches that God has emptied God's own self of any intention to punish anyone ever. Despite the Bible's repeated claims that God's major activity seems to be punishing people. That's extraordinary. But that's there in Genesis 1 where God says, you're made in my image and likeness. And in effect, go do whatever you want, but certain things won't work. It's your identity. It's your character. It's who you are. You're in the image of God. By all means, do whatever you want. But don't say, I punished you when things happen. If you think you're a bird and go up to the 30th story of a building, don't say God hit you with the pavement as a punishment. There are consequences to living against our identity. So the first very page in the Bible, which was written to be the very first page in the Bible, by the way, warns us that we're in God's image and likeness. That's identity. That's who we are. There's no intervention from God to punish anyone. But we are free to deny our identity and take the consequences. Or to live our identity and be who we are. That's the emptying of God, so that God is not there, in one sense, in total control of us by our identity, not by punishments and rewards or interventions or any sort of calling us back to the factory to be retooled or anything else. So despite the fact that the entire Bible is filled with God punishing people, the poor Israelites live on the Levantine coast in the middle of empires. If they spent their life praying on their knees, the only difference in the Old Testament would be they had died on their knees. And to say they're being punished by God when the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Greeks or the Romans come through? Don't pitch your tent on the interstate and wonder why God hits you with trucks. That's a good summary of the Bible. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> I did, never thought that would be the thing getting applause at Mission Gathering. It's great. Uh, <laughs> so I think a natural question to ask you, and I'm sure you've gotten this before, but I'll reveal a little bit of your biography. You, you started your journey in some ways as a priest. Yep. Um, and you've devoted your life to Jesus and studying Jesus. Um, what do you find so compelling about him? Why have you devoted so much time and energy to studying Jesus and speaking about Jesus? Yeah, you're right. At the age of 16, I entered the Roman Catholic uh, monastic order, 13th century order. And the reason for that was because I thought it was the most exciting thing I could imagine. I really was. It had nothing to do with giving my life up for God. I was 15 when I made the decision. <laughs> I was at a boarding school in Ireland. And, you know, I, my father was a banker. 
I adored my father, but the last a banker. I had been an altar boy when I was eight. I was uh, trained by priests in the, in the uh, high school, the boarding high school I went to. Being an ordinary priest, yeah, boring, seen that. But the idea of a monastery, that sounded interesting. So it was really an adventure. So to understand me, the driving force in my life is adventure. Now, I don't do crazy stuff. I really don't. <laughs> the things I do and things I don't do. But adventure sparks me. So the, the idea of being a priest, being a monk, but first of all, being a monk, that was the primary thing, was adventure. It sounded like the most exciting world. It was a bigger world than anything in my small little village in Donegal. It was a, a, a giant world. Then I, but I had gone to a, a classical boarding school, which means I had five years of Greek and five years of Latin by the time I was 16. So I was used to reading that stuff, granted in the original language, before I ever got to see the New Testament. And growing up in Ireland, we, we didn't have the Bible around. I mean, the big book was the Missal. I, I, of course, I knew the stories of Jesus, but mostly to the Rosary and the Stations of the Cross. I don't know when the first time I literally saw a Bible. It, it was liable to be after seminary, honestly. I, I came up to the Roman Catholic tradition. So Jesus struck me as terribly exciting. There was something going on here. Now, I, I had all the background of Rome. As I said, when I was a kid, I read the Aeneid. The, it, it so I knew, the, I knew the Roman stuff. I mean, when, when I first heard of Pilate, I did, ooh, what's he doing? You know, where did he come from? So Jesus sounded interesting. Now, fascinating, really, as an historical figure. I think that's what, that's what captivated me. It was like a, a, an adventure in, 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 in search or something like that. So I had all the history background there. I knew all about the Roman stuff. So it was a matter of filling out the matrix of Jesus and understanding what he was doing in his own time and place. I didn't start with, with a kind of a dogmatic vision of Jesus. I don't know how that is. I started really with, with the matrix, with the world. And then he, he fitted into that world. He made sense. If Caesar was the son of God and divine and Lord, then to come on and say that this peasant from God-forsaken Nazareth, fortunate term, but God-forsaken Nazareth, was Lord, Son of God, Redeemer of the world? How do you take the titles of the emperor who lives on the Palatine Hill in Rome and give it to a Jewish peasant from the Nazareth Ridge in Galilee? This must be some kind of a joke. Maybe it's like Saturday Night Live. You know, it's a, we're, we're spoofing the whole thing, and the problem is the Romans have no sense of humor. <laughs> they knew exactly what was said. They're saying, this is not the way to run the world. This is the way to run the world, or not to run the world, if you prefer it. That was radical. That was profoundly radical, and made absolute sense the more I experienced the world. So the excitement that was there from the beginning has done nothing except intensify. Thank God for that. And I haven't grown old and crotchety in the process. <laughs> <laughs> old, yes, not crotchety. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So one of the, one of the things both in both of the lectures I got to hear you give yesterday, and in conversation, one of your passions and also one of the most important things that I think you continually highlight is this concept of matrix. And I know you'll hate this comparison. Uh, but matrix in your language is kind of at least similar to context, understanding the background, um, but it's not the background, as you say, uh, understanding the world in which Jesus emerges from and how you really can't understand Jesus, you can't understand Paul, as we were talking about this morning, unless you know the world that they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And I'll just share this. Um, I have a problem with Paul. How many people in the room generally feel like they have a problem with the Apostle Paul? <laughs> okay. So I was sharing that with him this morning in my office, and he, you said to me, well, wait a second. If you actually understand what Paul is doing in the New Testament, if you understand the context that he's speaking in, he makes a lot more sense, and it's not as uh, crazy as a lot of us perceive. Can you talk a little bit about matrix yeah. and that? Okay. 
I'm using the word matrix not because it's some profound new scholarly breakthrough, but to avoid disjunctive terms like text and context, background and foreground, because although we all accept that, we're really good at saying, oh, of course there's text and context, yeah, context. Let's talk about the text. Or background and foreground. Of course they're both important. And let's get to the foreground. It happened to me, National Cathedral in Washington, I gave a lovely talk about the Roman matrix of Jesus and signing books afterwards, a lady came out and gave me a lovely smile. She had no book, by the way. And she said, this was lovely background. And I mean, that was all she said I mean, and moved on. But I knew, well, she also said, to be honest, she said, I heard Marcus Borg and I heard Jack Spong here in this cathedral and I felt the spirit was there and I didn't feel the spirit tonight. Okay, thank you for sharing. <laughs> so I began to think, okay, as long as we have these disjunctive phrases, it's just background. Now, think for a second. I'm going to talk to you about Martin Luther King Jr., but nothing about the context or background of American racism. How are you going to do that? Let's talk about Gandhi, but no background about British imperialism. Well, good luck. You wouldn't be able to understand what's going on. I have a dream. Well, sure, we all have dreams. You wouldn't know what's going on. So matrix is the common sense of its own time and place. What everyone knows. If somebody says to me, what do you think about Woodward's book? I at least know what they're talking about. I, I, maybe I don't, but if I do, I, I have some idea what's going on. Matrix is common sense. Now, here's the problem. You read a Greek text translated into English from 2,000 years ago, and why on earth would we think we know the matrix? I mean, if you speak to me in Russian, all I'm going to have to say is, I, I mean, I can't say, I don't think I believe that. Or be, so anything from Jesus or Paul, you put it back in the matrix of the first century, you say, what did people think he was talking about? Then you make your decision, by the way. Okay, I get it, it's still valid. Or I get it, that's totally dated, that makes sense in the first century, that might have made lots of sense then. It's like if you were in the 1930s in Hitler's Germany and somebody were to say, Jesus allein meiner Führerist, Jesus is my only Führer. Oh yeah, I know why you're going to be dead very soon. Even though Führer is just an ordinary word meaning leader and what's the big deal? If I didn't know the matrix, I would say, why were people being killed in, in the 1930s of German for calling Jesus the Führer? No, he's not the son of God. How do you mean he's the leader? Matrix. So matrix is what makes sense of the thing, and then you make your decision. It's a key word for me. Totally. And I, so what I'm doing is the matrix reloaded. <laughs> Next book title, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably copyright of this. <laughs> I think that's, for so many of us, I assume that's pretty mind-blowing because it, there's so much in scripture that you wrestle with, uh, just educated in a religious or church context, and we spend so little time understanding the world that they come from. Um, I'm going to bait you a little bit more into that direction because I think Paul is problematic for so many of us. And you said today... Um, if you don't understand Roman imperial theology, the theology of Rome, then you're not going to understand what the Apostle Paul is writing about when he talks about justification yeah. and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and this goes back to uh, in the year 2000, Marcus Borg and his, uh, Mary Ann Borg and Marcus invited Sarah and myself to be co-leaders taking 40 people around uh, Turkey every year in search of Paul, that's what we call it. We thought we found him, really. But every year we took 40 people. And that's where I got Paul, honestly. I had no interest in Paul particularly before. I really wasn't. I was interested in Jesus. But w walking, looking in the ruins of the Roman Empire, putting Paul back in the matrix of the Roman Empire, especially after 9-11, walking through the, the ruins of the great empire, we get Paul out of the Reformation where we're asking him questions he, he can't answer. So, for example, take the word you used. In Romans, Paul is talking about a good Greek term, dikaiosune, which we translate as righteousness. It really means justification, justificatio in Latin. 
any Roman would have said, well, yep, that's our program. We're making the world a just place. See, you barbarians were controlling you. You used to come out of the, the German woods and kill people. You don't do that anymore, or we kill you. We have justified the world. Now, in the process, we've justified everyone in it, of course. So Paul is saying a word that any Roman, if they bothered reading Paul, would say, okay, but wait a minute. He doesn't seem to be saying that it's justification by Caesar. It's justification by this. Who's this Christ guy who keeps coming up and he's going to justify the world? So <laughs> Romans, they got it right, not because they were reading the, the, the epistle to the Romans. What these guys are doing is kind of nonviolent, but this ain't us. This is un-Roman activities, as it were. So when you... Okay, nobody should read the New Testament without reading Virgil's Aeneid first, because that is the New Testament of Roman imperial theology. Homer's Iliad would be their, their Old Testament. So if you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament of Roman imperial theology, then you're ready when you read the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Christian Bible to say, ah, I get it why these guys are going to be dead. These are two different, radically different visions of how to run the world. And one or the other is going to have to prevail. And of course, it starts making sense then. So what I found is when I put Paul back in that first century and wandered the ruins of Turkey, it's, Turkey is magnificent because there's much more Roman ruins there than there are, of course, in the Jewish homeland in Israel because it was demolished in the wars of 66 and 74. So, but you can see them all over Turkey. Paul, Paul became alive for the first time. That's what I wanted to write about Paul. Before that, I had no interest in writing about Paul. So I got Paul, I didn't do much homework with secondary sources, really. They bored me. They were all talking about the Reformation. I just wanted to read Paul in the ruins of the Roman Empire. Sit in the sunlight at a place like Priene. Look at the ruins that said that Caesar, big letter, letters this high, Caesar, is the son of God, the God to be worshipped. Oh, that's what Paul is opposing. That's why he has a short life expectancy. Totally. And I think there's something so profound, once you begin to understand the ways that Jesus is contrasted with empire, Jesus is contrasted with Caesar, that has a lot to say to us in our current political climate. When we see followers of Jesus, if we're going to take Jesus seriously, then we are being called to clash in a way with empire as it stands today. Can you talk about what, what it would look like uh, for people to follow that radical movement of Jesus in the context of 21st century America? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's terribly important not to think that the, the clash was totally with the Roman emperor, that they were particularly bad. I mean, if you wanted to compare them with the Assyrian empire, I think they were probably better. But the pattern of civilization of our species, 70,000 years ago, our species, Homo sapiens. Sapiens is the Latin word for wise, which means that we have an oxymoron in our <laughs> name. We are, we are the wise Homo. Came out of Africa 70,000 years ago, spread across the world, and haven't done too well, because with that process, empire, our the rule of the few over the, the many has become the pattern of civilization. That's what we're up against. If it was just the Roman Empire, but well, it's gone. But there always is another one coming. And they always come announcing they're here forever, and they never are here forever. Otherwise, we'd all be under the Assyrians or something. So there's a pattern of empire which is deadly, <laughs> especially for, for the rest of the world. Sometimes the homeland of empire may survive. I think it's a bankrupt pattern because it has escalated violence steadily. It takes more and more power and force to contain people. Thank God it does, that we don't settle down and accept it. So American empire is simply the long, the last in a long, dreary line of empires. Maybe the homeland will be all right, but it's on the periphery of empire 
that all hell breaks loose when the empire recedes. It really is, even in small countries like, like Ireland or somewhere like that. So basically, the vision of Jesus is a radical vision. It's not a liberal vision. It really isn't. It's not a conservative vision. It's a radical vision. It's not a violent vision. It really isn't. It's convinced that violence is the problem and therefore counter-violence, even if it's understandable, and I do understand it, and I know it, it may happen, and we're not talking about pacifism. We're talking about how do you stop the escalatory violence that has the pattern of civilization for at least the last 10,000 years. One of the things we showed last night to think about is that it only took us 85 years, I think it was, to get from the right flyer on Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to the stealth bomber. We are really good at this. And that's not a crack about anyone. That's, that's simply a crack about our species and its future and how it looks. So basically, the radical vision of Jesus, it's a patient vision, it's not a violent vision, and it's a persuasion vision. Can we persuade people to take a good look at our species? I'm going to say this. Forget about religion for a moment. Forget about Jesus even. Forget about God. Take a look at the record of our species. It's an open record. If you want to say the last 10,000 years of human evolution, since the Neolithic Revolution, or read Genesis 4, where Cain kills Abel, the farmer kills the herder, and builds the first city. Oh yeah, that's the Neolithic Revolution in a couple of verses. Farmer kills herder, builds first city, violence escalates. It's all in Genesis 4. And I mean that as a literal reading of Genesis 4, not a metaphor. So the radical challenge of Jesus is basically, how will the human species survive? That's the challenge. And you can put it in terms of religion, Christianity, or you can put it in terms of human evolution and come up with exactly the same challenge. Will superior violence solve violence? If only we can control enough people everywhere by our superior violence, will we have peace? And the Romans would have said, duh, of course, that's the way it works. And they would have said, look around you. Isn't it working? We have our legions on the periphery, and inside that periphery, everything is peaceful. So, to try and imagine the pipsqueak peasant from a tiny hamlet in Galilee starting a movement to say no to the Roman Empire, which was at the height of its success, and could show you peace everywhere, because their genius was to put their legions on the periphery and keep peace inside not keeping the, the legions at Rome ready to go out, but on the periphery. So inside that, everything is peaceful. The Pax Romana. What do you mean the peace of God? And I think Jesus would have said, you guys don't get peace, you get lull. L-U-L-L, -L, lull. And the next round is going to be worse. Because it always has been. So that's the challenge. And the Jewish tradition knew it because they'd been watching empires for 500 years because they all kept coming through their homeland on their way to fight the others. So they had a long experience with empires. So much to unpack there. Uh, but as we're coming kind of to the end of our time, I want to give you one a chance to talk about your new book, Resurrecting Easter. But I want to specifically ask about this question, which is the question at the heart of the book. The book looks at two visions of resurrection, the Western vision versus the Eastern vision. And you found that this Eastern vision of resurrection, the way that the Eastern world saw Jesus' resurrection from the dead, was more collective and universal versus the individual resurrection of the West. Can you dig into that a little bit? Yeah, the background, my background, <laughs> the background is simply that as I said, from 2000 on, we were always going to Turkey every year. We were going for Paul now. We weren't particularly interested at all in Byzantine archaeology or, or iconography or anything. But we were seeing it. We could not because it was everywhere. So we started to see something strange. If you went into a church, there was all the way around the walls there was the life of Jesus. And you looked at all that, you recognized, okay, of course, that's in a, 
<laughs> somebody with wings talking to a woman, that's, <laughs> that's the, the Annunciation, two women hugging, that's the present, the uh, Mary, Mary and Elizabeth. You know, you, every, you recognize everyone. Crucifixion, that looked just like ours. And then you came to the one after the crucifixion and before the ascension. And what you expected from the Western tradition is Jesus coming out of the, the tomb looking rather like an athlete coming out of the gym, you know, all magnificent with, with, with uh, guards at the feet. Instead you saw, here's what you saw, Jesus carrying a small cross, not the great big wooden one, but a real cross with his wounds showing and he's reaching down and he's grasping the limp wrist of Adam and Eve. Limp wrist of Adam with Eve standing there are eventually limp wrist of both and hauling them out of their sarcophagi, out of their tombs. And that's Easter. What on earth does that mean? Adam and Eve ain't two people. <laughs> Adam and Eve is the human race. So if Adam and Eve are being raised from the dead, Hades, he's, uh, good old Hades is the gatekeeper of, of Hades, not of hell, but of the place of the dead, and he's standing behind the doors, kind of ge keeping Jesus out. And Jesus comes right in and kind of flattens him under the doors. So the, the bifold doors of Hades come out like a cross. And poor old Hades is looking up. Um, it's almost like saying, nothing personal, you know, I'm just liberating people from prison. So, well, it's, kind of, it's like kind of the good old A team, remember, way back. Um, that's the image you're seeing. Jesus, Hades on the ground, kind of flattened. The human race being liberated from death. Now, the question, when we finally got it and saw it enough, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd gone to Russia, we'd gone to Egypt, we'd gone everywhere from France to Syria. 2010 was the last year, we, by luck, we were able to get into Syria. We found this image everywhere. Everywhere. And finally, this is Eastern Christianity's Easter. Western Christianity, we know. It's all about Jesus alone. Now, maybe you can say, and if you believe that, it may happen to you or whatever you want. But it, it, it fits very much with our super man, our spider man. One person is going to do it all. Instead of this is a very intimate relationship, holding the hand. What does it mean for having an historical figure who died for nonviolence because he's still carrying his cross and got the wounds of crucifixion, liberates the human race from death? I can't think of that any other way except in human evolution to ask the, the evolutionary question, what saves our species from destroying itself? And the only thing I can see there is Jesus is, of course, the incarnation of nonviolence. It's not just Jesus. He can't do it alone. It's like a magnificent metaphor. It's a parable of possibility. A metaphor and a challenge that could happen. if we join the program and figure that the human race has to save itself from extinction. I'm not reading that picture as having anything to do with me, don't worry, you won't die, you'll, you'll live forever. I'm not seeing that there. Adam and Eve are not two people, as I said, they're the human race. So what we ended up in this book with was a huge challenge between the Eastern tradition and the Western tradition. The only case where we have two different, radically different images from a scene from the life of Jesus. All others look pretty much the same. If you look at the nativity in the West, nativity in the East, Mary is lying there after birth. I mean, you'd recognize it. But this one is radically different. And I think the Eastern one is closer to the New Testament and is a far greater challenge, realistic challenge, to our future. So that's a commercial message for the book. <laughs> it, it's called Resurrecting Easter, How the West Lost and the East Kept, the original Easter vision. 140 about full color images, high definition images. My, my beloved Sarah is the photographer and the, the iconographer who handled all of that material. And the images, we try to put them, you know, when you're talking about and it says, see figure one, it's not tucked away at the back in some color image. It's right there so you can see it. 
but it is a visual book. It's really images with commentary more than it is a book with illustrations. So uh, if you ever do get it, don't get Kindle. I mean, I love Kindle, I use it all the time, but it doesn't work for full color illustrations. I haven't seen it, but I, I don't see how it would work very well. Anyway, that's the book. Well, thank you. Let's give it up for Dr. John Dominic thank Russell. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.